aqui. Welcome to our first session of today. I'd like to remind participants that the chat rooms and network spaces are there for you to speak to fellow participants, to meet, to network. And we really encourage that you do use them. Uh, we really would love for people to uh, take time to continue the conversation. So the first session of today, I am going to introduce our three presenters for this morning, beginning with Professor Jeff Borton, Adjunct Pro Associate Professor, James Cook University Cyclone Testing Station, Jeff Borton with a wealth of experience in damage to buildings after wind events and evaluating resilience of building to wind actions. We present, this presentation covers information on why buildings are damaged by strong winds and how they can be strengthened to improve their resilience for future events. He will be followed by Rowan Stokes and Robert Smithson. An introduction by Robert Smithson, Project Manager, Rottnest Island Authority, and a presentation by Rowan Stokes, Director, Australian Discipline Leader Structural from Stantec, and Project Structural Lead and Superintendent for both projects. This presentation explores two significant heritage projects on Rottnest Island, watch them up. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to you all. Um, I'm Jeff Borton, a Senior Research Fellow at the Cyclone Testing Station. The Cyclone Testing Station is based in Townsville, um, but uh, I'm here in WA uh, in Noongar country and have the privilege to share it with the Wajuk people. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. The Cyclone Testing Station uh, has core business about keeping buildings safe and people safe inside those buildings. We do testing of a whole bunch of different materials. We investigate damage after tropical cyclones and other strong wind events, even test whole houses, uh, scale models of them in wind tunnels or complete buildings, as you can see on the far right-hand picture on the, the screen. What we're going to be focusing on today resilience of heritage buildings to cyclones and storms and we'll cover these uh, main topics starting with tropical cyclone Saroja. One year, one and a half days ago, uh, the people of the Midwest were hunkering down as they were hearing and feeling winds that they had never heard before. Um, it battered towns for hours so that they had been hunkering down for hours before the really strong winds arrived, but now that the strong winds are here, it was totally insane. They could hear their buildings being torn apart. They could feel with each onslaught of wind, and it wasn't giving up. It was pounding gust after gust after gust. Cyclone Saroja crossed the coast around Kalbarri, and then the path took it southwards even to the point where there were strong winds when it came out through Esperance. In this map here, the colours represent the percentage of design wind speed, so that the current design wind speed in this region here was, but was higher than the winds in Cyclone Saroja. Cyclone Saroja was only 80 or 90 per cent of the, the design wind speed, and as it deteriorated, it went over the coast, a drop down to 70 to 80%, then 60 to 70%, then it crossed over into Wind Region A. Wind Region A is an area that we expect lower intensity winds than Wind Region B, which is this part of the map. And so because wind speeds are a little less, again, the percentage of design wind speed jumped up to just less than the design wind speed, and then it dropped off as the uh, cyclone continued southeast, deteriorating as it went. Now, the reason the people of the Midwest know it almost to the hour, how long they've been since cyclone, is that most of them are still waiting for their houses and buildings to be repaired. It does take years for whole communities to recover from trouble. And 
something we've experienced across the whole country from Cyclone Tracy in Darwin, which took off the order of five to 10 years to get Darwin back to operational, to Larry in North Queensland, where it took about three years. Um, the, the reason is the sheer volume of work that has to be done. And it did do damage to older buildings. And we've seen this building on a number of presentations yesterday. But the key points are that, as um, Mark Edwards said, that the earthquake code didn't exist when these buildings were designed, neither did the wind code. The first Australian wind code or standard around 10 years before the first earthquake standard. So that buildings such as this were not built to any particular wind standard. It wasn't just that building. Heaps of older buildings suffered problems from tiled roofs to sheet roofs uh, to stone buildings to brick buildings. Lots of different buildings suffered damage and older buildings suffered damage. Uh, newer buildings suffered damage damages as well. So let's look at uh, wind effects on buildings. Why does damage happen to buildings when the wind blows? And it's a combination of pressure, of suction and internal pressure that we will look at on these next few slides. So the windward wall, as the wind is blowing toward the, the wall that the wind strikes as it hits the building is called the windward wall. And as the wind hits this wall, it's tending to push that wall inwards so that things on that wall are moving in towards the house. The wind then moves around the house. So it hits that wall. It can't go through. It has to go around. So it runs along the windward wall and it comes out the side here. And then it gets turned around and pushed this way. As it's crossing that corner, it's coming out from the wall so that if we think of a building, the building that we're, we've got on the slide is a three-dimensional thing. As it's the windward wall, it moves sideways across the building and then it comes out at right angles to the side wall. So as it comes out at right angles to the side wall, it sucks air out from the side wall and that causes suction on the side walls. So we have pressure on the windward wall, pressure on the side walls. Exactly the same thing happens when the wind leaves the windward wall and goes up over the roof. It's away from the roof and it's sucking air out of the roof and we get suction on the top of the roof. And then as it goes past the building, it's moving away from the leeward wall and we get suction on the leeward. Isn't it amazing that when we think about wind actions on a building, we have one surface, the windward wall, that has pressure into the building and everything else is causing suction out of the building. The suction on the roof can be quite huge. On a building with 100 square metres of roof area, in Cyclone Saroja, we would have been getting of the order of 18 tonnes uplift, tonnes suction, pulling it up into the air, um, when the peak gusts were arriving on the building. Now, interesting things happen if we leave windows open. So if we leave a window open and the window happens to be on the windward wall, the windward wall pressure that's outside the building here can come into the building through that open window. And it now is able to push upwards on the underside of the roof uh, outside, on the inside of the leeward wall and so on. So that now, in addition to the uplift on the roof, on the top of the roof, we've got uplift on the bottom of the roof as well. If the window happens to be on a side wall, you guessed it, we've got suction on the side wall. And that suction means that now we've got suction inside the building. That actually helps with the roof and the leeward wall, but it does increase the, the bending on the windward wall. So now we've got pressure in this direction into the building from the outside and we've got suction into the building from the inside as well. So it's going to mean things are more likely to break on the windward wall and then we get back to this situation. The other one I'll point out is that if we have a hole here in the roof linings, wind, windward pressure from this wall here can now get up into the roof space, blow a ceiling down 
and push the um, the roof up. So that how would these things be there? A window or a door may have been left open. It could have been blown open or in a tropical cyclone, we get heaps of wind-borne debris flying around. And here are some pictures. This one here with the roof. That was from Cyclone Saroja in the Midwest. This one with a piece of timber, uh, 50 millimetres by 100 millimetres, poking through a palm tree, wide as my shoulders, um, that um, happened in Cyclone Larry in North Queensland. Can you imagine the force required to drive a piece of timber through a tree like that? In these ones here, we're looking at a single piece of timber was driven through a roof in a building there. Other bits of debris had hit the building here and knocked off skylights from the roof. This was a roof that crashed into the back of a house. A part of a roof that crashed into a house broke a cyclone screen and a window and part of the roof. You can see that debris able to open up um, openings on the side of a building. Why does it happen in tropical cyclones? You'll recall I mentioned that in Cyclone Saroja there were lots and lots of gusts. Debris is thrown into the wind stream by something breaking and it becomes part of the wind stream. It's moving slower than the gust. The gust overtakes the, the, um, the bit of debris piece of debris will start to drop until the next gust hits it, lifts it up again, and again, as each gust hits it, it lifts it up and moves it into the, the airstream until it's accelerated to about half the speed of the uh, gusts themselves. So that it is something that does happen in tropical cyclones. Once uh, some debris creates an opening in a building, there will be other gusts that blow into it. Um, and so pressurise the inside of the building. Um, so internal pressure, um, we have broken windows or doors increasing the pressure on the inside of the building. Now, if debris is going to hit a building, it's always going to hit on the windward wall. And the windward wall is the wall that has pressure on it. So that pressure goes into the building and is pushing up on the underside of the roof and therefore it may lead to roof loss or other wall damage. It almost doubles the loads on all of the tie downs in the building. So many times when we're talking with homeowners from um, uh, Calbarry and Northampton, they were telling us everything was okay until the window broke. Once the window broke, the roof came off. Now designers in wind regions A and B can design for low internal pressure. In that case, they have to make sure that the windows and doors themselves have enough capacity to resist the wind pressures. Modern doors and windows are tested so that when you buy a glass sliding door or a window, it has a pressure rating on it. And a designer can say, this is the pressure rating we need for our new windows. But when we were designing these buildings, there were no pressure ratings. We do not know what the pressure rating on those windows are. So it's very difficult for us to be able to say, those windows are going to be able to cope with the wind pressures. They will remain shut. The alternative is to design for full internal pressure. And we'll explore that a little bit later on. Here's an example of some internal pressure problems. This window broke during Cyclone Saroja. It pressurized the inside of the, the room. The, the ceiling was in poor condition in a corner of the, the room because it had got wet over the years and the ceiling was blown through. That allowed air to get through the ceiling to the underside of the roofing and it lifted the roofing off. So what could have been just a simple thing to fix, a broken window, became a major building. And what we're trying to do is to minimize that. So thinking about how buildings blow away, let's turn our attention now to what keeps buildings intact. And it's a tie down chart. The uplift happens to the roof sheeting. So there's a bit of roof sheeting wrapped around a power pole that wasn't tied down properly. Tie the roofing. 
Parliament and the news or Perlins. Here are some that were tied down properly. That's a success story. See the way the roofing has been tied down to the battens. That has worked perfectly, hasn't it? Well, not quite. The to be tied down to the rest of the roof structure properly. And in this case, that was the weak element. And if that's the weak element, everything above that weak element. In this slide here, the battens were tied down properly. But the trusses weren't down, tied down properly to the top of the walls. And the roof structure has disappeared. I appreciate that all of these are not here, but they're illustrating the point of this tie down chain. And even if the, the roof is tied to the top of the walls, okay, but the bottom of the walls are not tied down properly, we can lose a lot, as in this picture. But this tie down chain is really important. If we think about it's going to be screws. So we might that ties the roof down. Have four or five of those screws tying the roof down to a batten for every after connection, every one of the connections on the, the batten down to the roof. For these, do you think that one nail is going to be able to resist the force of four of these screws? No, we're going to require something more substantial than that nail. Now, they did, may not have known that at the time that the Heritage Building was built, but we do know it now. So we've got to put in more substantial tie downs and things get really interesting once we get to the top of the walls. If it's a framed wall, we can tie timber to timber and put a steel rod down through the front space and that will work well. If it's uh, tying a timber roof into stone or brick walls, they're dissimilar materials and it's going to be much harder to make that connection. But having earthquake presentations yesterday, if we've got earthquake strengthening in our walls, that gives us something that we can anchor our roof structure to. So there's a synergy, and this was mentioned by Peter Airy yesterday, between what is done for um, tie down of wind loads and strengthening for earthquake loads. It really is hard to tie timber roof structure to stonework. And here are three examples where the problem was these dissimilar materials. This is masonry construction, but the same kind of problem happened there. So that earthquake reinforcement to tie roofs down. If we've got roof repairs or replacements to, to do, um, we, we, that's the perfect time to upgrade the tie down system. When the roofing isn't there, we can see all of the bits of timber in the roofing. We can tie the ones that aren't properly tied down now into the rest of the structure. That will work really well. One of the things that Peter Airy mentioned yesterday was that it is good to reduce dead load for earthquakes. So if we have tiled roofs and we replace them with a lighter roof, that's good for earthquakes. This is one of the areas where earthquakes and wind work in opposite directions. The heavier you make a roof, it's got a chance of resisting the uplift. If we've got 18 tonnes of uplift and we've got nine tonnes of roof, we've only got to put in about nine tonnes of uplift. However, if we replace our nine tons of tiles with half a ton of roofing, the in the roof so that they can cope with the fact that we've got a lighter roof that is not working or that is working against the very high uplifts that we've got. While the roof is off, we can check for corrosion, timber splitting at connections. Connections are the big thing how a building is going to perform. So if we've got splitting at a connection, it's not going to work well. If we've got rot at a connection, it is not going to work well. And if we've got nails, the nails may have deteriorated, but in any event, they're not going to cope with really high winds anyway uh, and will be needed to be replaced by some significant screws. So these significant screws are going to have to be put into the timber. And these where 
buildings used to have tiled roofs. They've been replaced with sheet roofs, but the tie downs are hopelessly inadequate for the lighter weight roof. It really is important. Heavy roof with a lighter one, we've got to improve all of the tie downs. Now, working in a modern environment on an construction of standards that, that we are bound to follow if we've applied for a building permit. And differences when we're working national Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Rob Smithson. I'm with the Rottnest Island Authority. I've been there since 2001 in the various various roles. Uh, for most of it, it's been in the project management and more recently looking after the built infrastructure, which includes the heritage buildings on the island. Um, certainly got a passion for West Australian history and a uh, fantastic place to work on Rottnest. We're blessed with some beautiful old buildings on the island. Uh, of course, we also uh, fairly exposed to severe weather. Um, uh, during the winter particularly. Um, so a little bit of a, the background to the roof structure upgrade project. The catalyst for this work was was interesting. It wasn't weather related. It was a uh, an incident that happened in 2009 where a, uh, a, a pillar uh, collapsed uh, due to some horizontal loading by a, um, a uh, hammock that was attached to that building. It wasn't a heritage building. Um, as a result of that, there was a flurry of investigation and engineering inspections and uh, the conclusion of those inspections from a sample of buildings that were were sampled was that um, most were inadequately tied down, if any tie down at all. We just heard about the, the tie down chain from Jeff. Um, rusted fixings, uh, nails, inadequate collar ties, toms and battens. Um, so that, that was the impetus for us to to do something about that. The pillars were reinforced almost immediately. Um, in 2013 through to 2019, we commenced a roof structure upgrade um, project on the island. So that ran for seven years. And we looked at a total of 387 buildings over that period, uh, including 62 heritage buildings. Now, this work was done during the, the winter months on the island, so uh, low visitation. But of course, that presented its own challenges with rain, weather, and uh, ferry crossings. Uh, so we had to be fairly flexible in, in our time frames. Um, so the, the, the 62 heritage buildings, they had various purposes on the island. Some was guest accommodation, like the, the beautiful buildings on, on Vincent Way. Uh, some of them are commercial. The, the governor's residence at the hotel, for example, and the, the general store, which is um, a heritage building, of course, uh, and some, some buildings which are off limits now, which are in particular the quad. Um, the, these buildings all date back to the early mid 1800s. Um, typically limestone construction, timber frame roof. Uh, there were some except for Kingstown, which is a, uh, a brick construction that was a, a building constructed just prior to World War II. Um, 
So our task was to um, take off all the roofs, essentially, uh, investigate the roof structure below. Uh, we took the opportunity to install new roofing on, on all the buildings, including the heritage buildings. It did give us a great opportunity to also investigate the electrical wiring in the roofing. A lot of these buildings had small ceiling cavities and no manhole access, so we certainly took that opportunity to to uh, upgrade any electrical um, issues that we found, bare earth wires, etc., and uh, in, install some new uh, some new anticon. Um, so our approach was obviously RIA aligns with the borough charter principles and uh, to minimise any impact on the fabric as far as possible to do as little as possible with achieving as much as possible i guess uh, we engaged a heritage architect for um, assistance in preparing submissions to state heritage office and also the, in, including those submissions was a statement of the significance of those buildings and the type of materials and the method we were going to use to to remediate these roof structures um, we also made sure that we had uh, builders through the tender process that had uh, experience in heritage construction and the uh, same likewise with the engineers that we had on board making sure that they were familiar with uh, or had a heritage experience. Um, when it came to some of the other trades we needed, particularly for the, the governor's residence at the hotel, we'd employed qualified stonemasons to do the, the limestone work there. Um, because it was in winter, we uh, and uh, the the program was on a fairly tight time frame. We did have the workers, the, the construction guys, stay on the island as well as the engineers that were there every single day. That that was a good uh, a good uh, process to implement because if we came across anything that was um, untoward, uh, we had an engineers there that were able to advise and provide solutions there and then. Uh, rather than uh, wait a long time, as you can imagine, if we've got a roof off and it's going to start raining, we don't we don't want to have that off while we're waiting for some engineering solutions. Um, so the structural design drawings, they I think they started out at about five drawings in 2013 and expanded out to 48 as we developed through that seven year process. Um, each at the completion of each each year's work, we received a engineer's report, which was photographic uh, documentation of the works and also certification and details of what was done to each unit. We also had uh, a similar document provided for the electrical components of each building. So at the end of that, we had, uh, had a fully um, covered reports on all those buildings. Uh, so that look, that's a brief introduction as to why 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 we kicked off this project. Obviously, it's a it's some great investment for protecting the the heritage buildings going forward. And I know even this when this Monday is going to be pretty pretty rough on the island. So uh, I certainly sleep easy knowing we've done that uh, that work to the roofs. Um, so fortunately, we also have Rowan, who uh, it was a structural engineer that oversaw the seven years of work here and on an engineering basis. So. Um, I'll sign off for my part now and Rowan will speak shortly. Thank you. Hi, so I'm Rowan Stokes um, from uh, Stantec and I was the engineer and superintendent for the seven years of um, roofing work on Rotnest Island. So I just want to talk you through that project first. Um, that's case study number one. There was some interesting heritage um, heritage work we did there. And then case study two is the seawall at Rotnest. And that was a fascinating project, the conservation of that. Um, so um, for those that don't know Rotnest particularly well, it's up the top left-hand corner there. Um, and the area with the red window is the main settlement, Thompson's Bay. And um, you can see the blow up there. So the, the seawall relative to Kingston Barracks and also cent Central Thompson, just to orientate you there. 
so we'll go through the roof upgrade project first. So it was a seven-year project, as Rob said. Um, uh, we were the structural engineers, the resident engineers, and uh, the superintendent. So we had a team team working on the job. Um, it was initiated following um, some independent and upfront investigations. Um, there was 387 public buildings and structures, including 62 heritage assets. Sorry, just having a few technical issues. Yeah. Right. Okay, sorry about that. Well, we've overcome our technical issues. Um, so there's 387 public buildings and 62 heritage assets as part of this program that went over seven years. Um, those heritage buildings um, were in the state registered heritage precincts of Thompson's Bay Settlement and Bathurst Lighthouse, including that. The cottages form part of the colonial prison establishment the pilot boat service and light station accommodation. We also had structures at Kingstown, Kingston Precinct, which were um, of, a, of military interest. And um, the approach was guided by the borough charter, um, as a lot of listeners would be familiar with, which is to do as little as possible, but as much as necessary. Um, uh, so our intention um, was to strengthen the roofs. Um, the early investigations indicated that there's a lot of shortcomings in the existing structures. Um, old fixings, as you can imagine, corroded fixings, um, you know, lack of collar ties, um, battens nailed, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's a fairly lengthy list of things that we wanted to address. So our aim there was to manage the risk of old concealed fixings, achieve a basic level of justifiable current code compliance. Um, ensure ongoing public safety and ongoing preservation of the existing fabric and structures. And with heritage work, it's often an ongoing conversation um, with the client to you know, find that right balance between conservation and code compliance. Um, so the design approach was as such, um, stabilize, consolidate and repair surviving structural members wherever we could. Um, we used flitching and scarfing as a heritage technique where we had to take out rotten timber. Um, we aim to achieve compliance, um, but the clear intent is to minimise any visual impact. Um, if we were putting new material in, we differentiated it, we made it look obviously new. Um, sometimes we date stamped it. Um, we introduced additional members only when necessary. Um, 
and replacement as a last resort. Um, we replace defective timbers with matching species and sectional sizes, and wherever possible, we concealed fixings. And as part of this program, we came up with a bunch of details that actually um, were driven um, from an aesthetic point of view. So we, we needed the tight end capacity, but we wanted to make sure that you couldn't see anything. Uh, there's an example of some of the buildings that we're dealing with there. It's a, it's a blow up of the kind of central Thompson precinct at Rottnest and, and a couple of examples of the types of structures that, that are characteristic of that area. So um, it was a cautious management approach, which is typical for heritage work. We investigated the information we had, which was limited. So it often involved, involved crawling around roof spaces and testing things and pulling sheets off and forming a, a view. There's a lot of reporting that went on prior to all of this. Um, we assessed the impact of the, the work from a heritage point of view. Um, we reviewed the guiding documents, physical evidence. We developed a conservation approach. Um, we documented the work and designed the work. And so um, Stantec did that in conjunction with the Timber Framing Code A 1684 and the Wind Code, obviously, 1170. Um, we um, sent submissions to the State Heritage Office and got um, comment and involvement there. And then we carried out the work, which was um, um, which was you know, done on a daily basis with detailed records as constructed drawings and everything and photographic evidence. So just quickly, um, and then we'll get some photographs. So the basic scope from an engineering point of view was strengthen the roof structures completely um, to um, achieve code compliance, which as you can imagine for heritage buildings is, is a challenge. Um, and a challenge particularly if it's not going to be visually obvious. So new fixings throughout, um, and we made conservative baseline assumptions. So where fixings like nails were obvious, we assumed that they were going to be corroded um, given the age of these buildings, which is some of them dated back about 150 years. And some, we replaced all of the roof sheeting um, with Colorbond Ultra. And we used the um, 21 mil profile heritage galvanized short sheet to the heritage buildings. Um, uh, new class four fixings to the sheeting. So one of the things that I found was that the um, a lot of the roof fixings were, um, weren't of the right durability rating and they were corroded and deteriorated. So that was a, a low hanging fruit. New Anticon. Um, Masonry repairs and wall removals was also part of it. Um, so we were challenged by the heritage architect to um, um, go with heritage short sheet with um, with twist shank nails on some of the heritage buildings. Um, I my research suggested there wasn't a lot of information floating around about the pullout capacity of twist shank nails. So we we set up some testing, had a had a company come in and do some testing and. Um, we we had them in seasoned and green jarra, twist shank nails down about 28 millimeter embedment, and we had them failing at about 1.4 to 1.8 kilonewtons. So we were comfortable with the with the quantum of testing that we did that we had an indication of what these nails could do into the material we were using on site. So that then enabled us to give the green light to select use of those twist shank nails. In a, in a more dense pattern, I should say, than what you would expect from tech screws. So some of the roof structures are really interesting on Rottnest Island. Um, the the um, split beam um, is well known over there. So we, we had some conventional stick roof type construction. Um, the split beam roofs indicated by that diagram there, which was what the early settlers did as a way of constructing roofs from a single piece of timber creating a triangulated roof beam, if you like. Um, Jarra trusses we had, we had ceilings constructed of, um, in the heritage buildings of lime slurry build up over bitumen covered sarking boards or plaster and lath as well. So there, there's a whole range of types of construction which made it really interesting from our point of view, um, color bond on the verandas. So some of the inherent issues, I'll just quickly flick through timber to timber fixings were often skew nails, varying degrees of corrosion, inadequate collar ties, collar tie bolts were corroded, inadequate tie down and sizing of, sizing of struts, absence of obvious tie down at perimeter, which was interesting 
to me there was there was a real absence of um, convincing tight end around a lot of the perimeters, and we saw from Jeff's chain of chain of loads that um, that that's just a critical um, a critical area to get right when wind hits and then starts to suck the roof from that windward wall. Um, battens were fixed with um, the heritage buildings were fixed with hand forged nails um, at, or bugle screws. The more recent buildings, but they were they were the wrong um, grade of bugle screws, so often internal screws rather than external ones. Um, timber rots, timber timber defects as you'd expect, um, and then just missing or clear unclear fundamental load paths. So, from an engineering point of view, we had to take a really um, you know, day by day approach to this. So you would think after seven years, there was real consistency in the issues and there was to a degree, but um, we found that there was often, every single day there would be a, a different case where we had to adapt details or come up with new things. So here's a couple of images just showing some of the yeah, typical stick style construction, all nailed. Um, the plaster and lath ceiling down the bottom left there, no collar ties. So to the solutions, um, a few of the heritage buildings had the original shingles and that was really valuable to retain those. Um, so we gave it a lot of thought and we actually came up with a detail that worked really well on site. That's the engineering drawing for it. And it was basically hole sawing over the battens and introducing a timber packer um, to get the level, the, the level that top of the packer sat above the shingles, and that gave us new a new surface to drop, um, you know, sheeting on battens onto, and then sheeting on top of those. So, and we got we got that all screwed right down using long bugle screws into the rafters underneath. So, an image of that is shown as such. Um, so you can see that's a, that was we we're pretty pleased with the way that all worked out, we were able to retain almost all of the shingles and essentially create a new batten plane um, and fix the sheeting to that. So that was that was one of the situations. Uh, we had lime slurry ceiling. So these, if you imagine a ceiling level, it was almost a floor construction with Jarrah planks over the top of the ceiling joists. And then we had the way they used to do it uh, back in the day was about 250 to 300 of lime slurry sitting over um, bitch, uh, bitumen layer as well. So uh, it would have been really good for insulation, but it, it posed a few challenges in terms of tying down things. Um, but one of the details we came up with, so the bottom right picture there shows um, the uh, one of the toms being tied down using a, a blocking piece of timber. Um, and then you can see where we had struggle getting into the walls, we actually built a sort of a, a little, um, low level, almost framed wall, if you like, and, and fixed down and got our load path from the rafters down to the ceiling through that way. Um, the engineers listening to this will be asking what capacity and how did you know the, the anchors weren't gonna pull out of the lime slurry? And I was pretty concerned with that myself, but we, um, we ran a whole uh, batch of testing on that front. And um, we got, so with 200 of embedment um, and chemically anchored, threaded rods, we got up to about five kilonewtons of load. So we based our details around that and that, that tended to work pretty well with those. Um, the perimeter tie down, co commonly in the more recent buildings, you've got a cavity. So the standard approach even in modern housing is a J rod um, um, around a, a pin that bridges the cavity or, or just um, PGI strapping built into the brickwork. Um, one of the heritage buildings we dealt with was the big Kingston barracks um, buildings. And we were pleased to find that they did have a cavity, but when we took the sheeting off, we found also that the cavity had been bridged by brickwork sitting over the top of the cavity. So we, we weren't able to get J rods readily in from the top as we were doing for the more modern buildings. So we uh, scratched our heads for a bit and came up with a, a new detail, which involved um, a threaded eyelet. To do it, so we dropped it. Just a straight threaded rod down, and we had to um, remove, carefully remove, using an Arbitec tool, a brick 
externally, which exposed this dangling rod. And uh, the contract was then able to get get the hand in and screw the eyelet onto it, um, embed um, the pin, bridging the cavity. And then we had um, heritage stonemasons that reintroduced the brick work and from the outside you would you would never know that it, it had been taken out when it was finished so that got us a fairly conventional modern style tie down in, a, in an old building and then uh, as Jeff sort of indicated it is it is challenging getting tie downs into solid walls and um, you know we, we've done that a few different ways with different heritage projects this shows some of the details that we employed on Rotness. There was, you know, strapping that ran down uh, the inside. Obviously, when it was within a ceiling space, so it wasn't exposed. That's the detail on the right there. The one on the in the middle there and the one on the left, essentially the same thing. They're kind of long drilled holes, and then either um, cementitious repair mortar, grouted threaded rods, or um, we we experimented with chemical anchors there as well and again we had all of them tested um, so we, we validated the the um, pull out capacities of all of those so we could sign off on the project so we got 15 kilonewtons out of those out of interest for 750 millimeters of embedment um, this is a different one this was one of the toilet blocks out at Kingston and it was you can see the corbel up the top there was um, spalling due to concrete concrete cancer essentially chloride iron ingress that had corroded the bars started to blow out the corbels um, there was no way to sensibly repair that because the reinforcement was so badly gone so it was it was deemed that we would remove the brickwork over it um, have some new corbels cast to the exact shape and we we then got them bricked back in and we date stamped those so that's an example of a kind of an approach where you've got no choice but to replace um, and you 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 make it obvious that it's a new replacement when you do that. So that's that's the Rotness style roofing program. And as Rob, Rob said, I also sleep a lot better having done the work that we did, um, tying all those roofs down now. I'm, uh, they're fair to say that they're probably rated almost to a, a low level cyclone uh, region now. So the second project was the seawall conservation and um, 150 year old structure built by convicts on Rottnest. Fascinating um, structure that a lot of people just walk past and, and don't pay attention to it. But it was built in 1865 using ashlar limestone sourced on Rottnest. Um, really, really significant from a social um, history point of view. It was Aboriginal, Aboriginal convicts that built it. Um, and it basically delineates the boundary between the settlement and the coast so it's kind of the, the um, you know the barrier between the sea and the and the settlement um, although it's out of the water range typically um, it's approximately 200 meters long and it retains up to 2.8 meters um, the wall heights went up to about three and a half meters so we had been kind of keeping an eye on this wall and doing different reports into it for some time and and we actually had it surveyed and we found that the wall kind of moved seasonally and it kind of it sort of swelled out during winter and then and then drew itself back in during summer um, all of all of that sent um, sent tingles of fear down the spine of down my spine at least when I was considering how stable the wall was um, so we had issues of public safety wall stability tree preservation because there's some big old Morton Bay figs behind the wall. And there was also archeological sensitivities in that area as well. Again, we were structural engineers and superintendents. Um, we worked with Colgan, um, a conservation architect, an archeologist and an arbor culturalist as well on that project. So it was, it was a few stakeholders. Um, the previous restoration work had been done in 1999. Here's, here's some old photographs. 1880 and 1920 of what the wall looks like so it's that um, you know that's the wall at the front there and all the buildings sitting behind it and that's it in plan view so what what I was expecting when uh, when I got some information about the cross-section of the wall was I was expecting to see perhaps 
a gravity wall structure that maybe had a um, a base about 70 percent or 60 percent or something of the height being retained but um, when it was investigated that's what we found and and that's when we did start getting a bit nervous because um, the engineers sitting out there would know that there's no way you're going to justify that for overturning or sliding or any of the failure mechanisms of a typical mass retaining wall so um, we had mortar blowing out we had blocks eroding at the front and then that was the cross section of it um, what we what we did so 600 millimeters wide at the base retaining three meters um, and we were quickly turning our minds to how is this thing even staying up? You know, is, is it going to collapse any, any day now? Obviously, it's been sitting there for 150 years. So something was keeping it stable. And what we knew was that tree roots were growing through this. We were seeing tree roots um, coming th right through the wall. And, uh, and my theory to this day is that the actual um, retaining abilities of all the tree root masses behind that wall was actually holding the lateral soil pressure back and uh, essentially the wall was you know, just a, um, a facade if you like so there's some examples of what we saw there's there's a huge big um, tree root coming through the wall so the geometry was a big issue we had unintended buildup of historic fill so the, the level of fill had been raised over the years um, up to 150 millimeter diameter um, roots and uh, we actually got together with the Arbor, Arbor um, culturalist and um, got, got into the science of working out what kind of pressure tree roots can exert. And it's not insubstantial up to 800 kPa, believe it or not, in a local sense. Um, previous conservation attempts um, had been harmful. So that was another issue. For instance, we had acrylic paints. We had some intitious pointing and patching, which is which is not good when you're dealing with soft masonry units behind. So getting rid of all the cementitious repairs was a, a key point. Um, concern over the development of the defects as well. So this, there, was, there was an area of wall clearly bulging and uh, we were getting cracking. We had telltales on it, on the cracks for a couple of years. So we, we knew things were kind of moving around um, and something had to be done. And there was also drainage as well. So surface water, the way the levels had been finished at the top behind the wall, water was directed essentially to the wall. So we're getting a lot of water coming down through the, the backfill and then resulting in salting um, coming through the, the wall, salts coming out of the, the, um, the mortar and exposing on the front face of the wall. So an early concept, um, is shown there on the right. So we, we had to deal with all of these issues. Um, the first one in conjunction with the arboriculturalists was to deal with the roots and, and also sort of negotiate which roots we could cut back. And um, the, the key root zone was um, about a metre deep. Um, and they were it was through that zone that a lot of the roots were going to, to surface out the front of the wall. So we cut back what we needed to under the arboriculturalist supervision. We um, put in a root barrier um, in conjunction with them. And then the intention from an engineering point of view was to, well, we, we couldn't do anything that was gonna um, destabilize the wall or in any way add to the cracking and defects. So um, we looked at some conventional things, but it was decided in the end that we would um, microfine inject this, the backfill material there to essentially create a mass block um, that was justifiable um, in terms of resisting lateral load. So, um, so um, this solution was um, decided on because it did a few things. Um, we didn't have to excavate behind the wall, which could have destabilized things. Um, it negated the need to un, uh, understand the wall geometry further. Um, so we didn't have to keep investigating. Certainty with regard to elimination of all roots impacting the wall and a permanent barrier to future root, um, root um, impact. Opportunity to build a root barrier to the appropriate height. Opportunity to engineer an outcome where the lateral earth pressures of the wall were effectively eliminated. 
and low environmental impact as well. So it was it was all very easily done and quietly done as well. So um, so just the the um, that's the plan view of the drawings about 200 meters as I said before, and that's the final final detail that we came up with. We actually um, grouted in some we, we had two blocks. Um, there was an original block that had been put in around the late 90s that was that top block the dark gray one and you know we we didn't ideally that wouldn't have been there and if it hadn't been there we would have taken the our new grout right up to the top but because it was there we didn't want to start trying to dem demolish that because it, that wouldn't have been good on a number of fronts so we came up with a solution of coring through it grouting from the underside and then um, grouting in tie rods to try and engage both old and new grout blocks. Um, there's a bit of a blow up there, um, just perhaps a bit easier to read, but um, there's your root barrier on the right hand side, the original block on the top and the new block on the on the bottom. And um, we also looked at drainage, we put a, a waterproof membrane on top of all of this, buried that with about 300 mil of sand and readjusted all the levels so that the ground was draining back away from the, the um, wall. Um, Colgan did a fantastic job in the stonework on this project and uh, you know, just experts at identifying um, the right mortar mixes. It was like lime mortars obviously that we used to, um, to repair the wall but we experimented with a whole different type of um, types of mixes until we came up with what we thought was the best one but um, it was really interesting to see um, so so typically two and a half plaster of sand to one susax hydraulic lime putty um, was the conventional approach but for a portion of the, the wall we used um, hot lime mortar and for anyone that's witnessed that it's fascinating to see um, so basically three plaster of sand to one quick lime um, that, and quick lime is produced by burning chalk limestone. I've even seen um, animal bones burnt for days um, to produce what we call the quick lime. And then the quick lime slaked by adding water, which causes an exothermic or heat producing reaction. And uh, so we, we had this, this mix in the wheelbarrow and when the, when the water was added, it was, if you can imagine a, a geezer sort of bubbling and spurting everywhere it was literally doing that and apparently you can get temperatures of up to about 300 degrees but when that cools down um, it, it produces a really workable and fat kind of mortar so there's some photos of the project you can see that original the photo on the right there the original um, grout block is, is um, what the guy is standing on and then the excavation where we had to delicately cut the roots and uh, get the root barrier in there on the right hand side. Um, we propped the um, the wall, particularly the bulging part of the wall during all of these works, just as a risk mitigation strategy. And um, you can see that the, the laborious bit was um, raking out all of the original mortar, particularly the cementitious repairs, which got us back to the original blocks. Um, where we had to replace blocks, we tried to use blocks off the island or blocks that we knew had come from the island. So really sensitive approach taken. And the resulting product is, is as you see there. So um, we've got a wall that's now stable from an engineering point of view. We've managed the future risk of tree root intrusion. And, uh, and as I said, Colgan did a beautiful job of um, some really sensitive heritage um, stone masonry work. Project lasted for about three months and um, and take a look at it next time you're on Rottnest Island. So um, thanks for listening. That's that's the two projects on Rottnest Island. Well, thanks, Rowan. Um, in a way, the technical glitch was fortuitous because I can now cross-reference what you were talking about. And, and I think you saw this slide earlier in my presentation before it disappeared, but what um, Rowan had done with all of those roof strengthenings was to look at a performance solution. Um, and this 
generally have to go in heritage work. We might draw inspiration from details in standards like AS 1684, but we have to craft something new that is appropriate for the building that we are working on. This is what the National Construction Code says, and I'll just draw your, the, the National Construction Code says that buildings must perform um, and the structural reliability clauses. I'll draw in your bottom two, so that they've got to be designed to sustain local damage. That's something like a door or window blowing in without losing the structure as a whole. The other thing is avoiding damage to other properties so that if we do send roof out into the airstream, that's not kind on other properties as well. And particularly where we're working in a historic might have control over some of the buildings, but not all of the buildings. It may be that debris is released from some of the buildings that haven't been strengthened. And so our buildings have to be able to in talking about appropriate strengthening, just as Ron was saying, our intent is to keep the building substantially intact, um, even after damages happen to other nearby buildings. And one of the first does in looking at selecting an appropriate annual exceedance property, and that the National Construction Code normally sets these. For most buildings we're working with, it is one in five what is used for normal housing and has a 10% chance of exceedance in 50 years. But when 50 years is the normal life we attribute to a house, but often with heritage buildings, we're working on a building that's 100 years old when we're starting the strengthening and we want it to last for another 100 years. So the probability is probably not enough for a building that's going to have a much longer life. We need to be looking at better than one in a thousand. So that way the designer will know that he has to use a slightly higher wind speed because of the longer life of the building. Then we're going to look at an appropriate internal pressure philosophy. And as Rowan has done, we document all of these things. So the AEP, discuss it with all of the stakeholders. It will push the cost of the strengthening up a little bit, but it will mean that the, the, the performance of the building is going to be better than the performance of the buildings around it. And this is what we're looking for in terms of pre preservation of the building, preserving our past. If we join the queue of people wanting a builder, after the, uh, a strong wind event has happened, then our building is going to deteriorate for the year or so that it's going to take for that work to, to um, take place. Think about the life of the building, um, annual exceedance probability you've agreed to. Engineers have the potential to, or, or have the, um, the ability to choose an internal pressure design philosophy. In the Australian standard that Ron was referring to, 1170 part two for wind region C and D, it says that we do assume we've got high internal pressures. I maintain if we're interested in um, the building and avoiding type of damage if we have a broken window, we should be using that philosophy for all wind regions. Um, and that means that we don't have to protect the by protecting the windows, things, things like putting shutters up over the windows to ensure that they don't break. Now let's focus on the connections. If we're driving screws into a seasoned hardwood batten, or, or even in some cases, a seasoned hardwood batten, so we're driving these in at a spacing of 150 millimetres, uh, that, that kind of thing, then that has the potential to split. Batten was put up there, was unseasoned, and it was relatively easy to nail a screw into without um, splitting. But now that it is seasoned, this is one where a, a, a dog did put in a whole bunch of screws that succeeded in splitting the batten. Even before the first gust happened, that batten was split down the middle. Then when the first gust did happen, the batten was not open its job and that precipitated the failure of the entire roof. 
Corrosion is a significant problem. And again, Rowan referred to that in a marine environment, a thin strap or nail plate or uh, framing anchor is not much more than 20 years. So here's one that was about 20 years old when the cyclone happened, it had no chance of surviving. Under those circumstances, there are stainless steel brackets that can be used. And if you are using them, there's a minimum number of fasteners that have to be used in order for the, the bracket to work well. Materials have changed over old metal roofing was thick ductile. The new metal roofing is thinner and more brittle, and it is going to require closer fastener spacings, as Rowan was indicating, so that they did tighten up their, the closeness of their spacings. In many cases, that means we're going to have to put in extra battens, um, plaster and plasterboard, and again, that was something that Rowan mentioned, vulnerable to water damage. Uh, and of course, if there's any damage to the roof, there will be water damage. And asbestos is a hazard, it's brittle, and it doesn't work all that well and may. So sheeting, use appropriate spans for the wind speed you've calculated and for the modern cladding, screws or uh, twist shank nails to the specification. And I cannot emphasize enough that you need to pre-drill hardwood battens to prevent splitting. I've done it myself and it doesn't slow you down too much. You feel a bit like a robo, a robot. You've got a drill in one hand and your screwdriver in the other. And um, it, it, it does mean a much better performance. Batten to rafter connections, I've talked about those. Nails just do not cut it. We must put in connection and again, a screw is going to be a completely hidden connection uh, and not interfere with the aesthetics, but they do need to be pre-drilled. And here are some more shots where have disappeared, leaving the rafters on, on the roofs. It is in really important detail. Roof to wall connection we've talked about before um, and Rowan has talked about as well. I just want to make the point, don't neglect verandas. And I was really pleased to see what Peter Baxendale did yesterday or showed us yesterday at York. That was a brilliant connection. Often the base of um, veranda posts gets very badly rotted because of all of the water that's there. If you can get the base up a little bit so there's plenty of air circulating around it, it won't rot out. And his connection was a cracker for the bottom of um, of course, structural reliability is only ever going to be as good as the materials that you've incorporated in the structure. There will be corrosion of metal, there will be rot and termite attack of timber. And if any of those things happen, it compromises the structure. All of those things are accelerated by water so that it is really important to keep a building maintained so that water the raincoat, the cladding on the building is really important for that. And for the last few slides, I want to address rainwater ingress. It really is important to have great rainwater detailing. And as soon as the that is the beginning of the slippery slope for any heritage building. Let's look at some examples. This is a box gutter. A box gutter has water fed in from both sides of the building, but it's over the middle of Normally what would happen, water runs down each side into the box gutter and then it drains away this way. If the wind is blowing from that direction, so if the wind is blowing towards the photographer, it can push the water back in the, the box gutter. So it doesn't get a chance to flow out that way. Instead, it piles up against the back of the box gutter and here's what happens inside the building. So the box gutter, immediately above this portion of roof. And look at the volume of water that is coming down. The wind is driving the water back up the box gutter so that it doesn't drain in the normal fashion. We've got more than a mop and bucket needed in aisle three. We better send um, a dustpan and broom. No, let's just close the shop. So that wind driven rain is a serious problem um, for buildings and the way they're going to perform. 
Now, when you think about it, when your car gets up to about 80 kilometers an hour, the water starts running up your windscreen. So if the wind is blowing at 80 kilometers per hour here, it's going to blow water up this more gently sloping roof slope. When it gets to this kind of flashing detail, it's going to go up underneath the flashing. So again, this is a combination of wind and rain. Once it gets under the flashing, then it runs down the inside of the wall and onto the ceiling. And again, this is a big problem inside the building. This is a valley gutter. Valley gutter between two roof slopes, they always happen where you have an internal corner on a, on a wall of a building. If the wind is blowing straight up the valley gutter, it blows it all of the way up to the top where again it drops over into the ceiling. It is possible to fix that by using some um, closed cell foam. So by putting closed cell foam that looks a little bit like this um, underneath the, the roofing, then that seals that space and means that water can't get in, even if it is blowing up the valley gutter. And the same kind of foam can be used at ridge capping as well. So when we look at really old roofs like this, this is clearly one that is suffering and needs to be replaced. Once the roofing is off, we can do all of the structural work very easily, the kind of structural work that Rowan did on Rottnest Island. Also, when we put the new roof back, we've got to make sure that all of the flashings are going to do the job of keeping the water out. And of course, once we've got a pretty much new roof on top of the building that is keeping the water out. When we add the other stuff to the, the building, it might be hidden solar panels, ventilators, all of this stuff is tucked away behind um, parapets so it isn't seen, but it does need to be tied back to the roof structure. If we just hook it into the roof sheeting, then that has the potential to increase the demise of the building. Okay, the final slides. So in improving the resilience of heritage buildings to cyclones and storms, in doing the design spec and in documenting things, think of importance level, think about the annual exceedance probability you're going to design for to protect the structure. You want the building to survive in a good condition, even the, the kind of event that's going to start to damage around it design the strengthening for full internal pressure. If we don't know whether the, the windows and doors have ever been pressure tested, and in most cases they wouldn't have been, then we have to assume that they're not going to be able to cope with the wind pressures. We should be designing for full internal pressure. That gives us a fail-safe building. We're not reliant on all of the windows and doors staying intact to keep the roof on very seriously at the tie down chain, just as they did at um, uh, Botnest Island. And yesterday we were told about also with respect to the rep. Um, and in terms of the performance, we're looking at uh, a performance of the structure itself, improving the waterproofing on the building and ensuring that we've got an appropriate maintenance schedule in place that can check this over the very long residual life that we've engineered into the building. This presentation was put together using some information that um, indicated on this slide. Uh, the Cyclone Testing Station did a report on damage in tropical cyclone Saroja, another one on Cyclone Damien, which happened in the Northwest uh, the year before, um, and lots of others as well, if you're interested in them from all over Australia and the Pacific. Um, there are some educational videos on re-roofing that indicate the importance of while you've got roofing off, look at and tighten up all of your other structural details. Well, thanks so much for listening. Thanks for persevering in spite of the fact that it was a split presentation, but the sandwich worked really, really well. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.